Once a year, we set aside a day to appreciate our moms. One thing we all have in common is that we all have a mother. <clears throat> Grade schooler, teenager, young single, married, empty nester. Uh, today is the day to thank God for our mom. Show our appreciation to her. Uh, pay our respects to her. Encourage her. You may not be sure what you believe about God or Jesus Christ, but you agree that we should honor our moms. Mother's Day is the third most celebrated holiday in the calendar year in the United States following Christmas and Easter. $14.6 billion are spent on gifts and dinners. 14.5 million cards are sent. Often children will send their moms a note. Eight-year-old Angie wrote, Dear Mother, I'm going to make dinner for you on Mother's Day. It's going to be a surprise. P.S. I hope you like pizza and popcorn. <laughs> Robert wrote, I got you a turtle for Mother's Day. I hope you like the turtle better than the snake I got you last year. <laughs> yeah. Eileen wrote, Dear Mother, I wish Mother's Day wasn't always on Sunday. It'd be better if it were on Monday so we wouldn't have to go to school. Diane wrote, I hope you like the flowers I got for you, mother. I got you for Mother's Day. I picked them myself when Mr. Smith wasn't looking. <laughs> this is one from Carol. Dear Mother, here are two aspirins. Have a happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Why did God make mothers? Here's what some seven to eight year old said. Question, why did God give you your mother and not some other mom? Answer, God knew she likes me a lot more than other people's moms like me. <laughs> Question, how did your mom and dad meet? Answer, mom was working in a store and dad was shoplifting. <laughs> <laughs> Question, why did your mom marry your dad? Answer, my grandma says that mom didn't have her thinking cap on. Question, who's the boss at your house? Answer, I guess mom is, but only because she has a lot more to do than dad. <laughs> Question, what's the difference between moms and dads? Answer, moms work at work and work at home, and dads just work at work. And dads are taller and stronger, but moms have all the real power, because that's who you gotta ask if you wanna sleep over at your friends. <laughs> Question, what does your mom do in her spare time? Answer, moms don't do spare time. <laughs> All of us owe a debt of gratitude to our moms, whether it's a birth mom, an adoptive mom, a biological mom, a grandmom, a foster mom, or some other woman who was there for us. There is someone to whom we are grateful. Jory never met her birth mom, but she's grateful for a wonderful mother who adopted her. I am thankful for my biological mom. As we thank God for our moms, it causes me to ask, what makes a great mom? Three things. One, a great mom communicates to us that we are loved and have amazing worth. If we know that we're loved and have high value, our mother has succeeded. The Apostle Paul in his famous text about love says, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Uh, when in doubt, you can never go wrong by loving. An eight-year-old boy came to church on Easter in a suit, and a woman got down and said, did your mom buy you this for Easter? He said, no, my mom died two weeks ago. My dad bought it for me for the memorial service. And she got down even lower and looked him right in the eye and she said, you know, my mom died when I was about your age. He immediately knew that he was loved and had amazing value. Two, a great mom helps us learn how to succeed in the world. A good mom helps us find skills to make it in the world. 
She helps us understand that we can do anything if we're willing to put in the effort and work at it. Angela Duckworth is a professor at Penn State. In her book, Grit, she defines grit as sustained effort and perseverance. A person with grit, she says, finishes what they start. Uh, her formula in her book is talent times effort equals skill. Your God-given talent times the effort you put in equals your skill. And then she says skill times effort equals achievement. Take your skill and multiply that by effort and that tells you how much you will achieve in your discipline. Her thesis is similar that, to that of the book, Talent is Overrated. You know, people say stuff like, Roger Federer, he's so amazing tennis player. He just kind of glides across the court. It's so, uh, he's so talented. Or Jordan Spieth, his stroke is so effortless. He's just like born to play golf. Or LeBron James, he just races down the court. He's amazing talent. Or Carrie Underwood, she sings so beautifully. Yeah, she's just such a natural. And Duckworth says, no, no. Talent is important, but effort counts twice as much. If a mother teaches her children to work hard, she'll be helping them succeed in the world. She will teach them if they put their heart into something and are willing to work at it, they can do it. One of the first verses I ever remember, uh, memorized uh, was uh, Proverbs 6, uh, 6 to 11. Go to the ant, you sluggard. I love that term, sluggard. <laughs> Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander or overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Successful people work hard. When Diana Nayad was nine years old, she stood on the shore of Florida. And as Castro's revolution was building in Cuba, she asked her mom, where's Cuba? And her mom pulled her close and looked out over the horizon. She said, it's right over there. You can't see it, but it's so close you can almost swim there. And that day, a dream was conceived in Diana's heart. A dream of being the first person to swim the Straits of Florida. When Diana tried and failed in 1978, <clears throat> At the age of 29, her dream went dormant for three decades. Then she tried again in 2011 and failed. And again and failed and again and failed. Then on September 2nd, 2013, undeterred, Diana gave it one more try at 64 years of age. Her motto, find a way. And that's exactly what she did through waters infested with <clears throat> white tip sharks and venomous box jellyfish, through black waters, dehydration and hallucinations. 53 hours and 110 statute miles, Diana fulfilled her dream and became the first person to swim from Cuba to Florida without a shark tank speaking to reporters who had gathered. She said, I have three messages. One is you should never, ever give up. Two is it's never too late to pursue your dream. And three, it looks like a solitary sport, but it's a team. How did Diana do what no one has ever done before? What enabled her to endure the physical and mental pain in her words, you must set your will. 
You need raw passion, a clear vision, and grit, Duckworth's word. But she says, you know, it looks like it's a, a solo performance, but it's not. It takes a team. Her team was 35 strong. And they had one rule on the boat. Nobody tells Diana how far she swam or how far she still has to go. Mothers that teach us to work hard give us a gift that helps us succeed in the world. Third, a great mom understands that parents have the primary responsibility to help their children become disciples of Jesus Christ. I suppose I should have written, a great mom understands that Christian parents have the primary responsibility to help their children become disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, good mothers instill faith in their children. They know it's their responsibility and they can't slough it off on someone else. They teach their children about Jesus and the Bible stories day after day and night after night. They do it by repetition. My mom taught me table manners from my earliest days. I, I don't think I can remember a meal where we sat down where she didn't say, Ronnie, get your elbows off the table. Sit up straight. Keep your mouth closed when you chew. If you have a teenager who has good table etiquette, you've done a good job. But the question I wonder is, how many times did you have to teach them proper table etiquette? How many times did you have to say, now Billy Bob, chew with your mouth closed. I don't want to hear the swishing, smacky sounds. When you chew, it sounds like a lion eating a carcass. When I look at you, I feel like I'm looking at an episode of Animal Planet. <laughs> or how many times have you said, Beulah, honey, sit up straight. You don't want to be stuck in a banana profile the rest of your life. I mean, we've read the story about the hunchback of Notre Dame. And... You know, we've seen the, the renditions of uh, the artists of Quasimodo. How did he get that hunchback? You're right. Didn't have good table manners. <laughs> Didn't listen to his mom and dad. And then one day, all of a sudden, he was stuck in that question mark position for the rest of his life. So sit up straight. We teach table manners by repetition. Many parents have forgotten or don't understand that God has called parents to disciple their children. So, by repetition, I want to share with you a number of passages in the Bible that make it very clear that it's Christians' parents' responsibility to disciple their children. Genesis 18, 19. For I have chosen him, this is Abraham, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he promised him. It was Abraham's job to disciple his children and grandchildren. Joshua 4, to serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. When the people of Israel were commanded by God to go in and possess the land of Canaan, the first move was to get across the Jordan River. And so God walled up the Jordan River so they could walk across on dry ground. And then he asked them to uh, build up stones as a memorial. Then the children would ask, Mom, Dad, what are these stones? And then they would tell them the miraculous story. Psalm 78, he decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. God's plan is for parents to teach their children who then teach their children and their children. 
2 Timothy 1.5, Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. How did Timothy learn about God? From his grandmother and his mother. Deuteronomy 6, this is Moses sending the people into the land of Canaan to possess it. And he's going to die, and so these are kind of like his final words. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. Now comes the Shema. This is Israel's central statement of faith, the most famous passage in the Old Testament. So who's he addressing it to? Well, this is going to be a conquest, a military conquest of the land of Canaan. So does he gather the generals? Well, it's going to need some intelligence. So does he gather the intelligence community? They're going to have to spy out the land. No, he gathers parents. That's who he addresses this to. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. He says, parents, first, you have to have it on your heart. You have to love God with your whole heart. Then you can pass it on to your children. If you don't love God, you can't teach your child how to love God. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. The point of all these verses is unmistakable. God has given Christian parents the responsibility to teach their children faith. It's our responsibility to disciple our children. Now, in our culture... We are taught that if you want to learn something, you go to an expert. If you want to learn to swim, who do you go to? Swim teacher, right? If you want to learn how to golf, who do you go to? A golf pro. If you want to learn how to play tennis, who teaches you? A tennis pro. If you want to learn to sing like these ladies up here, you get a vocal coach. If you want to learn to play the piano like Micah, you get a piano teacher. Right? Well, this sort of thinking rubs off onto our faith. Culture has convinced most moms and dads parents can't mentor their own kids. They're too old, out of touch, irrelevant, retro, lacking style, devoid of savvy, bereft of trendy, up-to-the-minute vocabulary. Parents are like yesterday's newspaper. Parents are clueless about how to deal with today's generation. We're obsolete. Kids relate best to other kids and young people. Moms and dads might as well own up to that reality, accept it, and pawn their kids off to the experts. Bottom line, parents are incapable of relating to, let alone discipling their children. If you believe that, you've been fed a lie. Neither the state nor the church is primarily responsible for developing the moral character of our children and leading them to God. You say, isn't the church, through its youth ministry, responsible to train our children in the faith? The vast majority of Christians today accept that tenet to some degree. The general consensus is that Christian parents are there to nurture their children spiritually in the younger years. They read them Bible stories before bed. They teach them how to pray. But then when our children are on the cusp of one of the most important periods of life, preteens and young adulthood, we're told that we must surrender them to the youth experts. A youth program plays a very important role in assisting. But parents 
have the primary responsibility to disciple their children. Psychologists, or not psychologists, sociologists, a professor at Notre Dame, Christian Smith, in his book Soul Searching writes, contrary to popular misguided cultural stereotypes, we believe the evidence clearly shows that the single most important social influence in the religious and spiritual lives of adolescents is their pastor. No, is their youth pastor. No, is their parents. Moms and dads matter. We know this because God tells us this in his word. I suppose the old adage, repeat a lie enough times and people will believe it, is true when it comes to this powerlessness of parents and autonomousness of children. It teaches parents that they have little authority over their children and indoctrinates children into thinking that they have nearly complete independence from their parents. The anthem is rising to deafening levels. There is a swelling chorus of voices in popular media, education, and political bodies to strip parents of their God-given rights and to emancipate children from the governance of their parents. Take, for example, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. It's been ratified by 195 nations. The only nations that have resisted ratifying the treaty are the United States and Somalia. So back to the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. God says, parents, this is the foundational principle. You love God with your whole heart. You get it in, uh, impressed upon yourself, then you can pass it on to your children. If you haven't given your life to Christ, if you haven't made a practice of attending church a, a priority in your life, doing so will help you be a better parent, a better husband, a better wife, better son, better daughter, a better person. A close relationship with Christ will give moms the ability to disciple their children. It'll give moms wisdom, and moms need wisdom. Mrs. Jenkins came to visit her son, Anthony, who had bought a house, and he had a roommate named Vicki. And as she watched them uh, make dinner, she just couldn't help but notice how beautiful Vicki was, and it made her suspicious that, the, that she was more than a roommate. And she watched them talk to each other as they were preparing dinner and setting it out. She just became more and more curious. And reading her mind, Anthony says, I know what you're thinking, but trust me, Vicki is just my roommate. Well, a week after uh, she had gone, uh, Vicki came to Anthony and said, you know, ever since your mom left, I can't find the silver sugar bowl. Do you think she took it? He says, I doubt it, but I'll check. So he sent her an email, and it read like this, Dear Mama, I'm not saying that you did take the sugar bowl from my house. I'm not saying that you did not take it, but the fact remains that it has been missing ever since you were here for dinner. Love, Anthony. A couple days later, Anthony received this email from his mom, which read, Dear Son, I'm not saying that you do sleep with Vicki, and I'm not saying that you do not sleep with her, but the fact remains that if she were sleeping in her own bed, she would have found the sugar bowl by now. <laughs> Love mama. Don't lie to your mama, Dio. Too smart. A great mom shows us that we are loved and have amazing value. She teaches us to work hard and takes her task seriously of discipling her children. I'd like you to meet Barb Sonnenberg. Barb is a mother of four children. She and her husband Carl. Carl serves on our board. Hi, Barb. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. 
So you have great kids, so I thought, you know, I'm going to bring you up here and uh, maybe ask you a couple questions. So, uh, you know, you've got Eric, who is uh, married and is a paramedic. Mm -hmm. You've got Linnea, who is in marketing in Seattle. You've got Charlotte, who's a senior at Portland State. And you've got Eva, who just started as a nurse in Federal Way. Yes. Uh, I don't know. Tell us a couple stories, highlights of, be, of being a mom. Well, it's been pretty fun. Um, and, you know, there's moments we had three teenage girls for, I think, four consecutive years. So that was, that was interesting. But um, <clears throat> I think, you know, when the kids were really tiny, we really wanted them to have a cheerful heart and try to keep from frustrating them or help them work through things that would come up. And um, I think one of the most sweetest memories of um, Eric's high school years was uh, he went to a small Christian high school and was involved in everything. And, um, you know, when you, when you commit to a sport or the small a cappella group, you have to sign a contract saying, this is going to be the priority. So if you do more than one thing, that you already have conflicts. So um, this a cappella group was the last period of the day, and Eric was in cross country and basketball and track, and so he would have to miss that last period of class. And so the teacher was showing some angst about that and um the away games were pretty far right well, oh that's right so we you know our away games were not like westview they're like sheridan willamina amity so it's it's a distance so um you know eric was upset and i said you know there's there's just got to be a way that we can make this work let's just let's pray about it let's see what we can do he didn't know all the conversations that i had with the principal and the instructors because I knew that would stress him out. So what we worked out was that on the away games, uh, and the buses are slow, you get there early, you know, so I would pick him up uh, like 15 minutes before class. And you're and fast. No, I did drive, the, no, he was in the car, so, you know, I did drive the speed <laughs> limit. But, um, <clears throat> and we worked out a deal where we had a CD of the music that they were learning in the you know a cappella group and we would play that in the truck and we would sing parts and talk and I got to know him better during that time than any other any other year of his life and I think you know I would have completely missed that if I had just thought you know this is just way too much work this is not going to work so sorry, you're not going to get to do cross country this year. But I think God honored the fact that Carl and I looked for a solution, and then we were blessed at the end of it. So I think it saved him from having that hard, um, hard place in his heart about being frustrated with the teachers. And then the other one, you guys have probably, some of you have already heard this, um, Eva, who also loves sports. She broke a bone in her foot her junior year also and was not going to get to participate in track. And she's a thrower. She loves throwing that shot put and the discus, and that was what she lived for. And so she now had a cast, and that was out of the picture. So she was grumpy and mopey and fussy, and so I, I was like, we got to find something for her to do. So that was when we were at Whitford, and um, they needed people to sing. So I said, you know, Eva, just go. Just try. No, I don't want to do that. So I said, just, just. You're talking about our church band. Right, right. Um, so I kept coaxing her, and I said, look, just go once. Just go one time. Practice one time. And if you don't like it, I will never make you go again. And, you know, the whole time I'm just thinking, you know, that's a rough promise as a parent that you make. Because <laughs> if you say that, then you have to do it. So, um she went, she came home, she was so excited. She'd gotten to know Lynn and Larry and all of the worship team. And then from there on, I mean, you know the rest of the story is that that was her place, that was her ministry. And I feel like that was when she really started to grow in the Lord. And we both look at that like, you know, we 
God did have a plan. We didn't see around the corner till later, but um, I think that was pretty awesome. Pretty cool. So you seem like a person <laughs> that might have a funny story or two. You got one? Well, um, yes. So uh, some of you know me well, some of you don't know me very well. The kids can attest to this, but um, every day when I like to work hard, I like to get work fast, I like to get it done, I don't worry too much about if I'm safe or not. And so um, every day when Carl goes to work, I'll tell him what I'm going to work on, you know, hauling gravel or trimming or whatever, and he'll say, <clears throat> well, Barb, just be careful. Be, just be careful. So every day, bye, Carl, be careful. So we were having our bathroom remodeled, and um, the upstairs bathroom has a, it has a ladder that pulls down to go up into the attic. And so um, I was going to go up there. The, the, guy, the workers needed, <clears throat> excuse me, access to the um, pipes and whatever up in the attic. So I went up there and I was clearing a path. And then I'm looking around and I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm up here. I might as well just sort some boxes and tidy up while I'm up here. So um, what I had done the last time I was up in the attic is I had moved some of the boxes so they were not on the plywood, but they were kind of straddling the beams. And I had forgotten that I had done that. And so in an instant, I mean, it was so fast, but also slow motion, I found myself up to my armpits in floor beams from hanging from, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, imagine that with one leg down, one leg up, and armpits on the beams, and I'm thinking, what am I going to tell Carl? Because <laughs> he had just said, be careful, and then how am I going to get out? Because, you know, you, you can't, there's not much leverage from here, you know. So about a half an hour later, I kind of worked my way out, shook off all the, you know, stuff, and then the doorbell rings, and it's our contractor. So he comes up, and he's like, oh, man, Barb, what did you do? So I tell him the story, and then the next guy comes, the plumber comes, and goes, man, Barb, what did you do? So, you know, every, you know, that went on, all day it was just hilarious everybody's laughing and then so for the rest of the week and the rest of the job it was hey barb you want to come up and help me with the plumbing you want to help me with the toilet it's like nope i'm i'm done with that but i think you know it's good uh -huh. having a good sense of humor people are going to laugh at you it's better if you're laughing with them as well because they're going to laugh anyway and i think they you know they thought it was a good sport so yeah thanks barb Thank All right, you. give her a hand. So this is the day to express our appreciation for our moms. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, today, and we do thank you for our mom, whether you know, we had a close relationship with her or whether we did not. Uh, whoever was there for us, uh, we uh, show our appreciation. And Father, we want to ask you to help us to show that kind of appreciation, to be the kind of people that do affirm. We're affirming of people and that we would do a good job today of expressing how grateful we are for our moms. Um, if you've never given your life to Christ, this could be a great time to do it. You could just say, Jesus, I do believe you're the Son of God. You died for my sins and rose from the dead. I want you in my life. Help me become the kind of person you want me to be, the kind of person that can express gratefulness to my mom or other people. You pray right now. Thank you, God, for being a great God, 
who loves us and shows us that we have amazing value and shows us that we need to work hard and that we need to know you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.